old? LeMay? Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 sequels with the biggest drops in quality. Greetings, Highlander. You called? How do you like that? What kind of idiot would steal a dead body? Oh. We did. What's up, Captain? Let's dance! For this list, we'll be looking at movie follow ups that massively failed to clear the quality bar set by their immediate predecessors. It doesn't matter if they're sequels or prequels, so as long as they were released after another entry in the franchise. The bigger the disparity in quality, the higher the ranking. A spoiler alert, as always, is in effect. What franchise do you think really dropped the ball? Let us know in the comments below. Number 10. The Last Exorcism Part 2 What are you watching? What? I'm watching you. The found footage genre was nothing new by the time The Last Exorcism came out in 2010, but it surprisingly managed to ratchet up tension with clever camera work and some truly creepy performances. You want to take this road, go straight, uh -huh. you see things you've already seen before, keep on going, you're going to hit the highway, okay? And then I want you to go back where you came from. Ironically, it would prove not to be the last exorcism after all, as part two came out three years later, ditching the found footage format in favor of telling its own story. A fair exchange, but it turns out that the story was incredibly trite and uninspired, with its setting of a home for girls being a poor substitute for the first film's atmospheric farm. Just know that the good Lord forgives you, and you can be saved now. He's told me you can be saved. Actor Ashley Bell proved she could still pull off the dual nature of a girl possessed, but she deserved far better than this. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Stop! Number 9. Hannibal. Granted, any follow-up to a movie that won five Oscars like The Silence of the Lambs was bound to be a step down, but factor in a change in director, lead character, recasting, and ten whole years, and you start to get a clearer picture of quality decline. Oh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. For starters, many felt the relationship between Clarice Starling and the titular antagonist was an unnecessary departure from what had been established, even if it's in keeping with Thomas Harris's novel. Would you ever say to me, stop? If you loved me, you'd stop. Not in a thousand years. Second, the tension becomes much less palpable once Lecter leaves Italy, giving the finale absolutely zero chance of matching its predecessor. Oh, now you're being rude, and I hate rude people. And third, while we love Julianne Moore, Jodie Foster is Clarice Starling. That doesn't interest me, Doctor. Frankly, it's. It's the sort of thing that Migs would say. Number 8. Grease 2. Was anyone really jonesing to go back to school? You gotta go back. Back, back to school the first Grease was a smash sensation when it came out in 1978, but you gotta figure a lot of that was due to the mass appeal of stars like John Travolta and Olivia Newton John, who failed to reprise their roles in the sequel. The then-unknown Michelle Pfeiffer more than holds her own as the female lead, but she and her co-stars are given next to nothing in terms of catchy numbers, trading greased lightning for a song about bowling? We just hope the summer lovin' prequel can wash the bad taste out of our mouths. Or the Paramount Plus series, Rise of the Pink Ladies. Geez, did anybody learn from Grease 2? Number 7. Zoolander 2 Just because a movie can be really, really, really ridiculously funny doesn't mean it can't not suffer from a freak sequel with no good jokes. Wait, did we just say that? Please accept my apologies, Derek. None taken. In any case, Zoolander 2 is an assault on all the senses, and its garish color palette and propensity for loud, senseless, and downright undisciplined humor will make you think it was made by male models, or at least the dim-winded ones that the film depicts. Old? LeMay? 
Ben Stiller proved himself a triple threat with the first installment, insofar as his writing and directing prowess only amplified his on-screen performance. The calendar was great because it gave people a chance to see a side of my versatility. Here, however, his cadence is thrown all out of sync, making for a follow-up that's just, well, ugly. We were a joke out there. A total laughing stick. Number 6. Basic Instinct 2 The first Basic Instinct wasn't exactly high art, but it more or less managed to ride the line between campy eroticism and genuine suspense. Basic Instinct 2 is hardly even aware such line exists. Some guys are into blondes and... Some guys are into killers. It flings Sharon Stone's Catherine Trammell into another sexually charged cat and mouse thriller, but it bafflingly tries to make us question whether she's the villain when we definitely know better. And while we're also fans of David Morrissey, who is a fine actor, missing here is the on-screen chemistry Stone had with Michael Douglas in the previous film. I'm not the one who's on trial for murder. Not yet. In short, Basic Instinct 2 more than earned its share of criticism. Number 5. Son of the Mask What's even the point of making a sequel to The Mask without Jim Carrey? Not to rag on Jamie Kennedy, but he simply can't match the level of effervescent humor that Carrey brought to the role. Also, his version of The Mask has really weird orange hair. Excuse me. <laughs> My bad. As if it wasn't a big enough drop-off, Son of the Mask possesses some of the worst CGI in a live-action movie, as the mask-driven dog and baby turn cartoon antics into pure nightmare fuel. Essentially, this standalone follow-up took all the visual cues of the first installment and forgot to back them up with much clever writing or memorable characters. Also, was Son of ever a good sequel concept? Hey, Loki. Honey, you look hot. Give me back my son! Number 4. Highlander 2. The Quickening. Greetings, Highlander. You called? Okay, first of all, the original Highlander movie has way more to do with the concept of quickening than this one does, so strike one, right out of the gate. Strikes two and three come when this film decides to trade the more fantastical elements for a sci-fi approach, and when it fails to tell a story worthy of its narrative ambitions. What do you want me to do? Help me. I can't. Not now. What happened to the McCloud that everyone believed in? That was 40 years ago. I'm an old man. Sure, it does better than most on this list by bringing back its biggest star in Sean Connery to once again grace us with his iconic Spanish accent. You know the one. But it also makes it worse seeing these memorable characters in such a dull movie. Man, maybe there really should have only been one. There can be only one. Number 3. Exorcist 2: The Heretic Okay, now we're really traipsing upon some hallowed ground. While The Exorcist 3 later proved there might be some wiggle room in making a franchise out of it, The Exorcist is such a singularly frightening story that it essentially eschews outright the need for a sequel. That the power of Christ compels you! The power of Christ compels you! Yet that didn't stop them from dragging Linda Blair back to continue the exploits of Reagan McNeil post-possession. Father, please bring her back! Where the first film found an almost poetic simplicity in its themes of good in the face of evil, Exorcist 2 needlessly complicates the narrative with endless exposition and backstory, thus nullifying the mystery in its mysticism. It kind of is heresy, huh? It was horrible. Utterly horrible. And fascinating. Number 2. Caddyshack 2 the hilarious first Caddyshack was barely a coherently structured movie, as its scattershot series of sketches came together to form only the semblance of a narrative. But that's kind of what we love about it, as side characters like Bill Murray's groundskeeper steal scenes at a moment's notice. It looks like I'm a wreck. It's in the hole! Caddyshack 2, on the other hand, has trouble replacing those memorable characters, as is perhaps best exemplified by an incessantly annoying caricature from Dan Aykroyd. I, I had a little trouble getting out of the roughs over there, and uh, damn if I didn't accidentally shoot myself with a poison-tipped crossbow dart. Look, this movie takes a big swing, and we can't fault it for that. 
But what we can fault it for is lunacy for lunacy's sake, without any comedic tempo whatsoever. Doesn't that take some of the sport out of it? Not at all. A lot of things could go wrong. Your batteries could go low. They could get static. Anything could happen. You know, sometimes the signal interferes with a pacemaker. <laughs> We'd give it a mulligan, but let's face it, we don't want to forgive. Before we unveil our top pick, here are a few honorable mentions. The Legend of Zorro Put a damper on the notion of a healthy franchise starring Antonio Banderas. It's all right, my darling, I forgive you. You forgive me? No, 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 I forgive you. You! For what? For everything you put me through. Everything I put you through? I would not be in this mess if you had kept your mask on. Next Friday Why'd they make a sequel without Chris Tucker, let alone two? Worst day of my life. Paranormal Activity 4. Found footage angle seemed lame all of a sudden. Please don't hurt me. <laughs> Book of Shadows. Blair Witch 2. A meta sequel that should never have been made. You know, if you don't believe in the Blair Witch, then why the hell did you bother to come? I thought the movie was cool. A Good Day to Die Hard. The franchise quality died pretty easily. We do for our kids. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Speed 2 Cruise Control Let's just do some simple math. The first speed involves a bus on a busy highway that will explode if it goes below 50 miles per hour. Speed 2 involves a cruise ship that can't stop going about 24 miles per hour in open water. So multiply that by pi, carry the two, yeah, it's bad. With all due respect, miss, this is not your car, this is a cruise liner. In all fairness, this sequel does try its hardest to conjure up a series of scenarios whereby exciting action might be had. But in all its flailing efforts, it just becomes exhausting. <laughs> I do believe we have a miss. Honestly, there are more pure thrills to be had at the shuffleboard court on the deck of a senior's cruise. This movie doesn't just make us seasick, it makes us speed sick. Yeah, we said it. I swear I am never leaving the house again. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.